Well, thanks, first of all, for having me here. I'm very pleased to be able to do this interview with you, uh, Haifeng. I have enjoyed getting to know you this semester and uh, spending this time in Göttingen. As you know, I've been teaching this semester about the Cultural Revolution in China, and I have made the point repeatedly in class, and I have done so in my writing as well, that the Cultural Revolution is a very important uh, episode not only in socialist China, but in modern history in general. It is one of the uh, most important moments where we see the uh, a, a whole people uh, accepting the idea that they had to contest hierarchies and dominations and uh, bureaucratic impositions and that they should take uh, the democratic process of uh, decision-making back into their hands. Now, this, of course, produced an enormous amount of chaos. Uh, it produced a lot of uh, uh, un unpalatable and unpleasant uh, uh, sorts of uprisings and uh, other types of um, difficult uh, problems for people. But the call to uh, question authority, to not take authority as the most important part of your everyday or your political life, was an extraordinarily attractive idea to Chinese for a certain amount of time. And it became attractive to many peoples around the world as well. Mao and Maoism and the Cultural Revolution traveled. Mao himself as a person did not travel, but his thought traveled. And his thought traveled most efficiently during the Cultural Revolution when peoples all over the world in anti-war movements, anti-colonial movements, uh, uh, nationalist independence movements, civil rights movements, and so on, were trying to question the authorities in their lives. And so for me, Cultural Revolution is not only Chinese history, it is history, it is modern world history of a very particular sort. And so it's very important. Well, the Cultural Revolution was, uh, at, in its most basic form, cultural. Uh, and so the culture didn't influence the politics or the era. The culture was the politics and was the era. That was the point of the Cultural Revolution, is that in order to have a true revolution in consciousness, in everyday life, in uh, understanding what the, uh, what the, what the, what the ideas that uh, both constrained and that enabled you, uh, that the, in order to do any of that, you need cultural forms. You need cultural forms that are embedded in your life and that speak to you, that resonate with your, uh, with your, with your ideas and with your uh, already formed uh, consciousness. And so the point of cultural forms in the Cultural Revolution was to push consciousness and push culture to the forefront of the uh, forms of transformation that would allow you to remake your life, remake your everyday life, and to remake the social relations of uh, cultural production and of political production and of economic production. And so given the Maoist idea that culture is consciousness itself, it is what you think, it's how you do, it's how you act, it's how you behave, it's your everyday life, it's the routines of your life. If you can change that uh, through uh, transformative revolutionary activity that is manifested in cultural forms, then you have truly revolutionized life. And that was the ideal. It didn't, in fact, work all that well all the time, but it was embraced for a time and it was very attractive for a time to many people. So I think the question is not about what influences what. I think it's about how culture and politics related to one another. There was a culturalization of politics and certainly a politicization of culture. 
uh, and it was uh, very dominant. Uh, that form of thinking was very dominant at the time. At first, it was very attractive, and then it became more and more imposed as the years went on. But I think one of the uh, important parts of the Cultural Revolution was that it was as revolutionary as it was cultural, and they can't be pulled apart. You have to have the cultural was revolutionary and the revolutionary was cultural. That's the point of it. Well, as with any history, your positionality in that history the you know in part determines how you're going to narrate it if you were a victim of persecution uh as intellectuals might have been um or as some intellectuals might have been uh then of course you're going to remember that uh era and you're going to narrate it as an era of trauma of victimization and of uh of difficulty and uh and and so on the government, of course, is going to narrate that era as an era of chaos because it was chaotic. It was deliberately chaotic. Mao in 1966 called upon the people to bomb the headquarters, to pal to, 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 to go and uh, explode the idea that the Communist Party of that time was the sole authority that should impose itself upon the people. And so the point of the, um, of the chaos was to make, for a time, to make the Chinese uh, state, the Chinese people, the Chinese nation, in fact, ungovernable because of the chaotic situation that was unleashed. So the government today, of course, is interested in stability, harmony, uh, uh, growth rates, accumulation of capital, wealth accumulation, and so on. And so chaos is, of course, not their goal. Chaos is not something that they really want to, uh, the chaos is something that they want to uh, suppress. And so the government, any sign of any sort of uh, uh, uprising from the uh, public sphere, from uh, the popular uh, social life is labeled in a very negative fashion, is labeled, oh, this might be the sprouts of another cultural revolution. And so the government is very much against the cultural revolution. And then different ordinary people, of course, experience the cultural revolution very differently. Some peasants in some villages experienced it as a um, the first time they ever had access to medical care and to uh, education. So their memories of the Cultural Revolution are quite quite positive. Uh, some uh, workers, especially from the early part of the Cultural Revolution, from the six the early the uh, 68, 69, 70 moments. They experienced the Cultural Revolution as a uh, democratizing uh, uh, mov movement to take over the dead hand of bureaucracy and command what they called commandism, economic commandism, on their on their production sites. So different people would have very different ways of understanding the Cultural Revolution. These days, it is mostly discursively understood as uh, and rhetorically understood as a uh, 10 years of catastrophe, of trauma, of uh, 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 it's, it's very, very uh, understood as very, very traumatic and very, very uh, 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 bad. Uh, in the Western press, anytime uh, with a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Cultural Revolution was about. The Western press labels any excessive uh, control of the Communist Party over the government, over the uh, people in China as an expression of Cultural Revolution. But as we know, that's an extraordinary misapprehension, mis misunderstanding about what the Cultural Revolution is. So, you know, as with all historical narratives, these are very contested. There are now 
new kinds of histories, new kinds of historiographies that are asking different kinds of questions and that are reevaluating certain forms of, uh, of, of understanding uh, the Cultural Revolution, particularly in the realm of reevaluating the cultural production of the Cultural Revolution, which now is seen far more positively than it used to be seen. Now it is no longer uh, repudiated completely. There are uh, some very positive ways of looking at uh, the films, the Yang Banshi, the, the model operas, the model ballets, the model uh, films, and so on. So it really depends, and it depends on who you ask, when you ask it, and what their purpose is in, uh, in narrating. So, but this isn't so different from any other historical moment. I mean, all histories are contested. Uh, the Cultural Revolution happens to be another contested history. Well, memoirs were uh, originally, and then subsequently as well, one of the first ways in which uh, individuals tried to make sense of what had happened to them. Most of the memoirs, of course, are written by intellectuals because they're the ones who write, they're the ones who get published, they're the ones who know how to narrate and how to navigate uh, the, the, the publishing world and so on. So, uh, but so memoirs became one of the uh, most important original ways right after the Cultural Revolution, along with uh, uh, literary products like scar literature, like like Shanghai uh, Wenxia, uh, like um, like poetry, and so on, became uh, real ways of documenting a personal uh, way of connecting the self, the person, the, the personal, to these larger issues. That is, in fact, what memoir does, is try to narrate the self into a larger uh, 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 form. And uh, as memoirs became more and more sophisticated as people became less and less interested in actually writing memoirs that were purely traumatic, purely about trauma, purely about uh, victimization, as people had time to digest and to think a little bit further about what the Cultural Revolution actually meant to them, new kinds of memoirs got written and new kinds of um, uh, uh, memories got uh, dug up in order to think through what uh, what what the cultural revolution was actually about. Um, we, uh, you know, in the class that I've taught this semester at uh, Göttingen, the uh, we read some of the memoirs of some uh, uh, female uh, uh, un now university professors in the United States. And most of them narrate their attempts to try to think through their um, experiences uh, in mem and to think through their memories in relation to teaching or talking to people who didn't go through these experiences. So how do you narrate this, uh, this episode, this very, very uh, formative moment in your life, because we have to remember most of the intellectuals who are writing these memoirs were uh, teenagers or young 20s. I mean, they were just forming themselves. And so these were formative years for many of them, uh, for the sent down youth and for, for, for young, young, uh, young professors, young intellectuals, and so on. And many of them felt the need to try to explain what this was and what they did during the Cultural Revolution to people who had not experienced it. And whether that was Americans, whether that was French people, whether that was younger generations in China, whether that was to themselves or to their spouses or partners or whomever, these memories, these new memoirs and so on, tried to take a more distanced view. And they were more distanced in terms of temporality uh, because the time lag between 
when they narrated and how they narrated was longer. And also many of them were from a geographical distance. So, you know, they may have been sent down to uh, some remote uh, place in, uh, the, in the Northwest or the Northeast or somewhere like that. And now perhaps they've ended up as a professor in uh, California in the United States. And so the geographical distance is also, and the cultural distance now is quite huge. So um, memories and memoirs take many forms. And the ones that were written very uh, soon after the events are uh, narratives almost exclusively of trauma and of hardship. And then as you move on into, uh, the, as you move further away from the events uh, in time and in space uh, and in cultural expectation, you get much more complex ones. And so I think it's important to read both uh, the, the ones that are more proximate to the events and the ones that uh, have uh, a little bit more distance from the events, because I think the, that gives you a better sense of how memory works, how memoirs work, and how, uh, how narrative uh, and history work in terms of memory and memoirs. Well, the legacy is uh, is vestigial. In other words, there's a trace. There's a trace uh, discursively when uh, the Cultural Revolution continues to come up as the negative example of everything that was wrong with that era, everything that was uh, that could that can be now uh, rejected of that era. So the legacy is one also, as I said before, is one of negativity. It's the negative trace, the negative vestige of that. Um, by the same token, there are many aspects of cultural forms that are being, uh, that were pioneered during the Cultural Revolution, particularly in dance, in, in, uh, in literary forms, and so on, that are being rediscovered as uh, actual uh, resources for how to renovate uh, a now a very market-driven uh, uh, cultural realm. And so how do you um, escape the, uh, the, the relentless dictates of the market by going back to these ideas of embodiment of ti xian, of trying to embody certain kinds of performative acts, how to learn from uh, from from uh, from from below, from folk uh, arts and folk uh, songs and folk forms, uh, and so on. And so there's a good deal of reinvention going on. Not all of it is consciously. Um, uh, uh, linked to or connected to the Cultural Revolution, but a lot of it is. Uh, a, a lot of uh, practitioners now are rediscovering in the uh, the in the sent down youth in the sent down cultural form where where uh, cultural practitioners during the cultural revolution had to go down and learn from the peasants and learn from coal miners and learn from 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 factory workers and so on in order to enact on the stage uh, certain kinds of embodied movements. A lot of uh, uh, cultural practitioners today are actually rediscovering these practices and embracing them anew for their new cultural productions. So I would say the Cultural Revolution uh, is has a political vestigial trace that is quite negative, and yet also has a positive trace uh, in the cultural forms. We could also mention, of course, the Cultural Revolution has become a commodity. Uh, because I remember being in Beijing and in uh, other places in the 1990s when Cultural Revolution-themed restaurants started to open and people who were somehow all of a sudden nostalgic about eating wotou, you know, corn, uh, corn 
things, I don't know, very, very poor people food, right, all of a sudden went to now very high-priced uh, 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 Beijing restaurants to uh, to sample these uh, these foods again because they were nostalgic for it. So there was a very uh, big moment during which the Cultural Revolution became um, a very big commodity. Cultural revolutionary uh, posters, badge, Mao badges, little red books, and so on, all became then commodities. So that in that sense, also. Uh, because we're now in a hyper-marketized era, the Cultural Revolution sells very well. It became uh, it became uh, a bestseller uh, in many ways. So we can see the vestiges of it there as well. Oh, I think practically every area has not been sufficiently researched because the uh, the the conventional uh, framing of the Cultural Revolution is still very rigid and very um, uh, uh, inimical to uh, complexity. It doesn't admit complexity. Uh, that's not universally true. I think there's, there is now some far more interesting uh, work being done. But um, I think uh, one of the more important arenas that we need to look at is to understand why people responded to the call to rebel. Uh, well, you know, Yoli, it is right to rebel. Why did people respond to that? If you went out and, uh, you know, these days and told people to rebel, they wouldn't do it. I, it there's not, there's, there's no resonance there. Why in the 1960s, not only in China, but all over the world, did the Cultural Revolution call to rebel to rebel against authority, rebel against organizations, institutions, education, uh, uh, politics, and so on, what racial orders, gender orders, and so on and so forth. Why was that so, so attractive? Uh, I think that has to really be taken seriously. We cannot think that people were just sheep and followed leaders. That wasn't true. It didn't wasn't true then. It's not. It it it, it can't be true as a as a historical uh, understanding. And so we have to really uh, delve far more deeply, not into psychology and so on. That I don't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not that interested in. I don't think that that really gives us a a a, a, a way in. I think we have to think about what was politically uh, unsatisfactory about the conditions in which people found themselves in China, in France, in the United States, in Oakland on, with the Black Panther movement, in, in, in many, many places, right, where Maoism traveled and where the Cultural Revolution traveled. I think we have to pay attention to that. I think we have to pay attention, as I said earlier, to the um, economic achievements of the Cultural Revolution, which were huge. Uh, and are very much underplayed because they were distributed in a way that doesn't measure up to the cap capitalist measurements of economic activity. Um, and so because during the Cultural Revolution, wealth was not accumulated personally, it was redistributed collectively, you have, a di you have to have a different way of thinking about that wealth and thinking about that productive uh, capacity. And I think that also has not been understood. I think the ways in which the Cultural Revolution uh, brought uh, education and medical care to huge numbers of people, was it the most advanced uh, cancer treatments available? Not at all. It was barefoot doctors who had rudimentary understanding of healthcare, but who were able to treat conditions that were often quite fatal, 
but were quite simple to treat if you had somebody who knew what they were doing. And so whether that was childbirth, whether that was, uh, whether, whether that was infections, whether it was certain kinds of uh, uh, commonly, uh, commonly uh, contracted diseases in the uh, rural areas because of bugs or whatever else, you know, uh, infections of various sorts. These are easily treatable, but if not treated, they could become fatal. Uh, and so you have a lot of um, arenas that still need to be understood as uh, real um, progressive aspects of what happened rather than the total negation that is still very much part of the, um, the narrative. Um, I think we have to get away from the narrative of the Cultural Revolution being all about Mao's power struggles uh, and all about uh, ways of thinking the uh, struggles within the Communist Party and between Mao and his nemeses. That happened. There is no doubt. But I think that to contain the Cultural Revolution to that and that alone is to miss all of the richness of many, many things without negating without rejecting the idea that the Cultural Revolution also was very destructive, intentionally so, but is, but it was also, and we have to think about what that intentional destruction actually means. So I think we have a lot of work yet to do, and there are people who are doing it. There are, um, there are archives uh, now, not so much available any longer, but there been there have been a lot of archives now digitized in Canada in Euro America that are no that are not uh, shut down by the Chinese Communist Party right now, uh, and so there are ways of of researching these, and we just need uh, good questions, better questions, and better researchers because the archives are there. We just need to ask better questions of it.